All right. Thank you so much, Heather and Lily, for joining me today. It is truly a pleasure um, to commune with you, even in this virtual space. Um, we're here today to share our thoughts and experiences with the Republic as professors who have all had a lot of experiences with this book, right? Whether as students um, or, you know, now as professors who are inflicting it on our students. <laughs> so um, I'm going to go ahead and open our conversation with this first question. When did you first read The Republic? And what do you remember about that experience? Um, I'm happy to start. Uh, and I, I, was, I was saying in an email that I read it in college and I know I read at least parts of it twice in college. And the first time I read it was not in a political theory class, but a kind of integrated class in the humanities. And the professor who was teaching us the Republic, who was a philosophy professor, and one of the things I still talk about with my students is one of the ways she explained the forms to us was with a chocolate Frisbee, a plastic chocolate Frisbee from Hershey, Pennsylvania, because it took part in a variety of different forms. And <laughs> it took part in roundness, it took part in frisbeeness, and it took part in, interestingly enough, chocolateness because it smelled like chocolate. Um, and that was probably my first year in college. Um, I know I read it for a political theory class my senior year in college because I took the political theory sequence out of order. Um, yeah, I know. I, I did the moderns in my sophomore year and the, the ancients in my senior year. So all of that before was totally incomprehensible to you. Yeah, you know, some of, the read Plato. <laughs> some of the references to, um, by Machiavelli and a couple of others to, you know, sort of Plato and Aristotle were a little bit confusing to me. Um, so yeah, but I, I think I straightened it all up mostly. All right. How about you, Heather? When did you first encounter this book? So I went to a really weird, small liberal arts college um, that uh, did the great books, right? So um, what, I, what I actually remember more than the Republic is starting with um, the Iliad and being really blown away that like this was a real class where I could read this amazing epic poem. Um, but I do remember, I don't remember specifically the experience other than we read Aristotle shortly thereafter, and my thought was, I would much rather go to Socrates' house for dinner than, <laughs> than Aristotle's. But the funny thing is, um, now as I'm teaching it, I'm, I'm much more interested in talking about Aristotle than about Plato. Like, Plato seems attractive because it's a, like it's a dialogue. It feels like a play. It has um, a plot. Right. There is, there, there is, in fact, a sort of linearity to it. Um, but I find, I find the sort of sweeping generalizations to be somewhat mystifying. Um, and I also, there's just a, the way that he does the like, so what you mean by X is F, correct? <laughs> right? And everybody's like, oh, sure, that's what I meant. Um, and so I, I find that a little, like the more I read it, actually, the more I get irritated by how he teaches, right? Um, but, uh, but I also love it because every time I read it, there's something else that I'm like, wow, I never noticed that before. Like, it's just such a great work that keeps you coming, coming back to discover new things so much. For sure. It's, it's a great text to teach in that way, that it, there's always some way to kind of keep it fresh and interesting for you as a, as a professor. Um, yeah, I, I read it as an undergrad. I was 18, you know, which I think is sort of the appropriate age to read it. <laughs> um, and it, it, it captivated me in all the ways that I think Plato totally designed it to, right? I was this sort of, you know, I fancied myself something of an intellectual and I was incredibly frustrated and, you know, to be surrounded by all these adults and this stupid, corrupt, nonsensical society. And here was a thinker who was going to sort of set all this right and sort it all out. And I was going to get to be a part of that. So yeah, I, I was totally taken. Now I think, um, I, I, I relate to the text in, in I, I hope, a much more mature um, way, but I, I still find it a, del a delight to read and to teach. Um, okay, so next question. In the course of the Republic, as I'm sure you know, Socrates puts forward some pretty radical ideas, radical by the lights of a kind of classical Athenian, but I think you know, radical even um, 
to readers today. So which of these sort of ideas, and you can take your pick from the smorgasbord, do you think is the most, I don't know, interesting, compelling, important? Um, so the thing that, I think the thing that I, I, you know, as I do my, my courses, I try to convince them that the author we're reading is right. And the thing that I try hardest to convince my students that the author is right about for the Republic is in fact that justice is at the core of our political inquiries, right? Um, and that goes so, again, the way he talks about justice goes so against our, our sort of dedication to, to equality that it's just such an uphill battle to try to imagine a world that is unequal and still just. Um, and so I, I, I love and I, I love the experience of being like, so what if he's right? So just go with what if he's right, that inequality and justice can live side by side, right? Um, and what if he's right, that justice is more important than equality, right? Um, so to me, it really is an extreme idea that we put justice, even if we define it differently, which maybe I would, um, that we imagine justice at the center of um, the sort of society that we build. And then of course there's the, um, the fun like gender equality, which of course I don't think is in fact gender equality. I think it's so we freak out less about the philosopher king, which is even more absurd, right? Um, but those are the two things that, that to me I think are, are most sort of engaging as a shift of perspective um, uh, that he jolts us like the gadfly, right? He jolts us out of our, our stupor um, to make us uh, reimagine and sort of like see our world differently. Lily, how about I, you? I, I mean, I think this is the place where my students kind of are often perplexed is of course book five. Um, and of course, not even the gender equality. They still are trying to sort out oftentimes for weeks how how all of that like not sleeping with your brother stuff is going to work. And I, I constantly talk about Excel spreadsheets that the philosopher kings have to have very complex Excel spreadsheets, which they didn't have at the time of the Republic. And that's, in order why, to they, keep... and that's why they mess up and the whole thing goes to pot, right? I know. <laughs> and, and so but we're, when we're doing that part of book five, it's always really intriguing to see students' responses to like, hmm. And, and the gender equality stuff is like also perplexing to them um, because they're like, okay. Um, and then of course the philosopher king, they're like, isn't that who Socrates is? <laughs> Yeah, no, no, totally. Um, I, I find that my students, they find the whole like, oh, there's going to be philosopher queens. Like that to them is passe because they like live in a world with Beyonce or whatever. Um, but what, what they react to, right, is this idea of like, and all the sort of gendered norms and conventions are going to be abolished to the point that, you know, men and women will be exercising naked side by side in the gymnasium. I mean, they just, that's like a kind of bridge too far for them. Right. Um, uh, which, which you know, is it's it's always delightful to see you know like a fifth century Athenian dude rile a bunch of whatever liberal arts college students in the twenty first century. Um, I'll add one more thing to this list um, that we haven't really shouted out yet, but um, that I think is a is a pretty provocative claim that Socrates makes and that I think is really interesting is his conception of the soul or the self or the psyche. Right, this this tripartite division of the soul into the appetitive part and the thematic or spirited part, and then of course the kind of rational uh, logos part. Um, you know, I mean, I that that gets me. It got me when I was eighteen, um, and it, it gets me today. Um, it makes a kind of sense. I often that that story. I forget the the name is uh, uh, Leon. I don't know, but when he sees the corpse and. He doesn't want to look, but he can't help but look. And then the spirited part of his soul kind of chastises him because he does look, you know, like, I mean, I have that experience like about 16 times a day. So um, yeah, I think that's, that's a kind of cool way to, to think about the self um, as, as far from a unity, um, but a kind of cacophonous, conflictual, uh, difficult to live in thing. Well, and, and the funny thing for me is um, I, you know, my, my parents, my my dad had a college degree. My mom, you know, read all the time for fun. 
Um, and so it's not like I grew up in a household that wasn't exposed to ideas and books, but they certainly weren't reading these books, right? Um, and so the funny thing was when I read that, that exact portion, I had heard all of that via Christian theology, right? Um, in growing up in a pretty, a pretty churchy household. Um, and so the whole, uh, all of Western philosophy is, you know, nothing more than a footnote to Plato. Um, suddenly I thought, wow, yeah, I can see a whole lot. There's just so much that has come out of this particular stream of inquiry that has fundamentally shaped our understanding of who we are. But because it speaks, I think, to our experiences of being like embodied flawed selves. Right? For sure. For sure. All right. So the other part of the book, apart from the whole like ladies and dudes naked together part that always riles my students up and Heather kind of like got at this earlier in some of her remarks um, that really gets my students um, is Plato's critical engagement with democracy as a, as a regime form, right? Um, his, his kind of savaging of equality as a political value worth aspiring to, um, his incredible skepticism and wariness of freedom. Um, this is something that my, my, my students are just revolted by, right? Um, so I guess uh, my question is like, is there anything worthwhile in this kind of critique of democracy that Plato gives us? Can we just shrug it off and say, well, Plato is backwards and wrong? democracy is the greatest form of government known to man. Um, um, or, or should we kind of sit with it and, and try to find something of value there? Well, I mean, again, I would, I, I, my students are sort of finding this, sort of like, how many sentences does he talk about democracy for? One. How long is the discussion of democracy? Like the whole chapter. Okay. <laughs> Why do you think that is? <laughs> yeah, and that, that, it, that it is sort of a, 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 it's both a beautiful and, and savage sort of image that he's painting for us, right? So on the one hand, the story of freedom that he gives us is like, I can be a painter one day and a, a musician the next and a philosopher um, the day after that. Um, and on the, other, on the other hand, this kind of like, uh, we think that's what freedom is, but maybe that's not what freedom is, right? So it, I, I think that whole discussion, the first time I read it, of course, I was totally where your students are, which is like, oh, well, that's just wrong, right? Um, the, the longer I've lived and the more of, of life I've seen, I'm, I'm increasingly convinced that there's some value to thinking about how we think about freedom badly, right? How we misunderstand what the purpose um, of, of, we elevate freedom over things like justice, right? Or over things like uh, virtue. Um, and that that comes with delight, um, but it comes perhaps with the wrong, with delighting in the wrong things, right? And, and misapprehending what it is that we should actually be, be going for. So I, I, and I have to admit over the what 15 or 15 years, I guess that I've been, been teaching the Republic, um, my students' responses to it has changed considerably um, uh, over time, right? Where initially they'd get to this section and they'd be like, oh, I guess that's okay. And recently there's been a lot more like, oh, huh, in democracy, tyranny is right next. How curious, right? And there's also the discussion of what freedom means. I mean, I think that's, that's where I have often found the students to engage it. Um, and, and sort of like, well, we understand it this way. And so what is Socrates talking about? And do, does, does he, is he thinking about freedom in the same way that we are in a contemporary American democracy that is perhaps different because like women can vote, sort of, um, <laughs> as opposed to we'll the see. Athenian democracy. We'll see, it, it, give us a few days, we'll know for sure exactly who <laughs> it, Theoretically. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, sort of have them start to think about, as you say, Heather, what, what is the value of freedom and what is it um, in our thinking versus to some degree what his thinking was about what freedom was and what it meant. And I also think that whole discussion um, uh, about the sort of forms of government, the thing for me that really sticks out, and I think even stuck out when I read it the first time, is that like the values of the society drive the form of government, right? So whatever your society prioritizes as the most important thing, then your forms of government are going to reflect that, right? And so um, 
so then we can turn it around and say, um, what, what values are our forms of government protecting? And they're doing exactly what they should do according to the institutions and to our values, right? And if those don't accord with our sort of explicitly stated values, then that makes us step back and say, what do we need to do to change the institutions so that they're actually pursuing the values that we say we care about? Or like the, the other side of that coin, I often think of when I read these sections of the Republic is, um, um, so we have our kind of institutional forms, um, but then there's this like huge um, aspect of, of human life that people are prone to thinking of as having nothing to do with politics and they call it culture or they call it society, right? But in fact, is, as Plato imagines that that is sort of the bedrock um, of a rightly formed regime. And so that raises the question of like, are we doing the kind of cultural work necessary to cultivate the kinds of subjects or characters or selves who can then inhabit these these political institutions right or 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 actually are we cultivating sort of you know characters and selves that are hostile to the values that we we want our institutions to embody and therefore setting ourselves up for a kind of uh conflict between those things and revolution right um so yeah, I think there's a lot of value in that. Um, and I also think like Heather was kind of saying earlier that even if the only value is um, chafing against our kind of certain certainties and uh, taking us down a peg or two um, and prompting us to critically reflect on some of our, our values, I like Plato for doing that for us. Um, all right, so last question. Is Plato's Republic even a book about politics? No. Say more. No. Um, I, more and more as I read it, it is, it is a book about education um, and, and understanding um, how to think about education um, and what the role of education is. And, you know, I'm at an institution where we are constantly rediscussing the value of the liberal arts um, and, you know, the sort of frustration that that brings with it. I'm like, okay, this wheel has been invented, um, <laughs> but, and it's been invented for a long time also. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, the books two and three, when I'm teaching them and trying to explain like, why do we spend all this time talking about the specific forms of education for these people? And it continues, like what is the education of the philosopher king when we get there? Um, and it, I think it's so much the thread throughout. Um, I mean, yes, it's about politics because the role of education is also about politics, but I'm more and more persuaded that it's a book about education. Yeah, I, I think um, I think for me at least it helps to think about how how present citizenship was in the life of a fourth century um, uh, pre Christian era um, Greek, like how central it was to be a citizen and how that was a real marker that not everybody was. What is it like a, a third of the population of Athens are are actually citizens? Um, and, and so in that sense, think, like, the, the approach to it is that the state is not separate from all of these other institutions. The state is an expression of, of all of these other institutions in a kind of higher integrated form, right? And just how different that is than our kind of modern conception of the state as a thing that's over there that other people do, that I show up for once every year or two and like cast a ballot um, at the voting booth. And that that's just not the conception of what political life is for ancient Athenians in the slightest. Um, and so in that, in that way, I, you know, it is a book about politics because it's a book about humans, right? And humans are the people who do politics. Um, so right. like I, I, I end up being an Aristotelian very much because I'm like, yeah, yeah, man is a political animal, you're right. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a book about people and politics is one of the things that we do. And the question is how do we do it better right or how do we do it in a way that you know that enables human flourishing as opposed to um disenabling that yeah 
just to kind of play devil's advocate a little bit, right? Aristotle thinks it's like a deeply unpolitical book, right? Or, or that, that what Plato does effectively is sort of like sucks the politics out of politics. He, he wants to create this kind of excessive unity that doesn't allow for the kind of plurality and diversity that um, at least democratic politics requires. So um, yeah, I mean, I've always seen this as, you know, more, more about soul craft um, than statecraft. Um, but no, your, your points are, are incredibly well taken that, that to um, a, a classical Athenian, those would not have, right, right, psychology and political science didn't exist as separate disciplines. <laughs> They were Plato is doing all of them at once, um, and I, and I also just think like I think it the Republic unlike almost any other book um, that I that I have taught, um, even if you are like incredibly irritated with it and frustrated with Socrates for being an obtuse like wanderer, um, it is all there. There are at least four or five passages that are so sort of engrossing that you read them and you're just like whoa. What if that? What if that's true, right? What if, in fact, that is a thing, like, like the cave, right? What does it mean to actually know what's happening in the world? We don't know, um, and so like those those passages are just so incredibly valuable for thinking about who we are and what we do and how we know and you know how we relate to other people and all of those things are such big questions. Yeah, so I think, and I think Aristotle's totally right. It's not political in a deeply important way. Um, and yet, on the other hand, it gives us so much insight and kind of, I guess, many tools to think about um, politics in another way. So I think it's just a great piece to teach in an intro to political theory course as like, hey, politics is important. Here's one guy's take on it, but we're going to read some other ones, you know. Yeah, yeah so we, we, I made my students and when we read Machiavelli after I said, okay, find the reference, the plot, the, the sort of um, obscure reference to the Republic and you'll get extra points. <laughs> He turns up everywhere. He, he turns up everywhere. Well, any final thoughts you want to add? You can do it. You can do it, kids. Keep reading. It's worth it. I promise. <laughs> I second what Heather said. <laughs> well, if there's, if there's two folks who could inspire uh, young budding political theorists to want to pursue it, it's, it's you two. I really, really appreciate your insight, your thoughtfulness, your generosity in, in being here today and talking with me and, and then also my students. And I hope we get to do this again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Love Thank to. you. All right.